Welcome everyone. I am David Weinstein, Director of the Center on Japanese Economy and Business, also known as CJEB, at Columbia Business School, and Carl S. Schaub Professor of the Japanese Economy at Columbia University. We're delighted you've joined us for day one of our 2022 Tokyo Conference. Unfortunately, we were unable to hold the conference for two years due to Colombia and international regulations in response to the pandemic. This has always been an, a special, exciting event for us at CJEB, and this year we are holding the conference virtually for the first time. We'll be covering important current topics over the four days with three keynote speakers and four groups of fantastic panelists. Before turning it over to today's speakers, I want to introduce the center briefly to those joining us for the first time. CJEB was established in 1986 by Professor Hugh Patrick, and in July of 2019, I became director. Our mission at CJEB is to promote knowledge and understanding of Japan's economy and its business systems in an international context. We adapted during the COVID-19 pandemic by providing webinars and have been, begun to conduct in-person events once more at Columbia, including at Columbia Business School's new Manhattanville campus. This April, we held two in-person events, one with Governor Haruhiko Kuroda of the Bank of Japan, and one with Takeshi Ninami, CEO of Suntory. While the business school provides our office space and basic administrative support, CJEB relies fundamentally on outside corporate sponsorship for the funding of our staff and center programs and activities. We thank all of our corporate and individual sponsors for their continuing support. One of the major themes of this year's conference is national and economic security. It is often said that security issues are like oxygen. If you have enough oxygen, you don't think about it. But if you don't, you cannot think about anything else. We picked this topic about eight months ago, and at that time had not anticipated the war in Ukraine. For decades, economic security issues were largely seen as minor theoretical concerns for most developed countries. But these issues have become central to economic policymaking. It's interesting to note that when I worked in the Council of Economic Advisors during the first Bush administration, these issues were raised vis-a-vis -vis Japan. Most famously, the Reagan administration blocked the sale of Fairchild Semiconductor to Fujitsu in 1987 on national security grounds. At the time, many people saw this not as a decision really based only on security, but as the result of rising trade frictions with Japan. The global pandemic has also raised serious concerns about the global sourcing of medical equipment, as many countries restricted exports of personal protective equipment and other medical supplies in order to help their domestic populations. Ironically, these policies almost surely resulted in substantial losses in life as countries hoarded supplies and medical supply chains were disrupted precisely at the moment we needed them to function at maximum efficiency. These concerns have also come to the fore following the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which has prompted a highly effective sanctions regime that has severely limited Russia's ability to import key inputs. Although it is not well known, there has been a sharp rise in the use of economic sanctions. For example, there were some 20 ongoing sanctions cases in 1960, but by 2014, the figure reached 170 cases. The record on economic sanctions is decidedly mixed. Unilateral sanctions imposed by the US have succeeded in changing the behavior of the target country in only around 40% of all cases. But widely adopted multilateral sanctions can have success rates approaching 80%. Moreover, sanctions tend to be more effective when the target country's 
trade patterns are concentrated in relatively few products. This historical experience suggests that there are reasons for optimism regarding sanctions targeting Russia, especially if Russia's oil exports can be curtailed, but also reasons to be pessimistic that the US trade war with China will change Chinese behavior substantially. It also raises questions about the future. The past 100 years have been a period of rapid globalization. This trend is clearly being reversed. And the question is, how profound a reversal are we experiencing? A related question concerns the increased weaponization of economic policy. What should the limits on these types of policies be? If the West uses economic sanctions to achieve its policy objectives, how should we react when China, India, Russia, and other countries follow suit? And what does all this mean for Japan? I don't have the answers, but I look forward to hearing the panel's thoughts on security issues. Now I'd like to turn it over to my friend, Merit Jaino, who is Dean Emerita of the School of International and Public Affairs, or SIPA, and Professor of Practice in International Economic Law and International Affairs at Columbia University. Merit is a core CJEB faculty member and will be introducing our keynote speaker and moderating our panel discussion. Merit, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, David. Good morning and good evening. Indeed, I'm Merit Jano, Dean Emerita of SIPA and Professor of Practice in International Economic Law at uh, Columbia's SIPA and longtime member of CJEB faculty. Uh, I'm truly honored to introduce today's keynote speaker, the Honorable Yoshimasa Hayashi, Minister for Foreign Affairs of the Government of Japan, a position that he has held since November 2021. Minister Hayashi started his career at Mitsuyan Company in 1984 and has held various senior government and party positions since 1995, the year when he was first elected to the House of Councillors. A member of the Liberal Democratic Party or LDP, he has served in an extraordinary range of senior positions including as Minister of Defense, Minister of State for Economic and Fiscal Policy, Minister of Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries, Minister of Education, Culture, Sports, Sciences and Technology, among other illustrious positions during his long political career. In the interest of time, I will not further detail his many accomplishments as this is a very special opportunity to hear from him directly especially given the historic circumstances we find ourselves in geopolitics with the profound implications for the world and the Asia Pacific region. Minister Hayashi will be speaking about the challenges facing Japanese diplomacy. At this time of great change in the world and new challenges in geopolitics and economics, we are very grateful to hear from him today. Unfortunately, he was unable to join us live, but he has sent us a recording of his remarks. This keynote address was recorded on May 20th. Let us now hear from Minister Hayashi. Weinstein Shocho, Goshustikino Minasama. CJEB Nenji Tokyo Conference no Kaisayo 昨年11月に外務大臣に就任して以来日本外交の課題について
政治的経済的な勃興を果たしてきましたこれは同時に主要先進国の影響力の相対化をもたらしたものでありますこのような国際社会のパワーバランスの変化により米国が単独で世界の平和と繁栄を支える時代は終わりを迎え国際社会は国家間競争の時代に本格的に突入したと言えます2月24日に始まったロシアによるウクライナ侵略はこの時代の変転換を誰の目にも明らかなものとしましたロシアによるこの侵略行為は冷戦後の秩序のみならず人類が過去1世紀にわたり築き上げてきた国際秩序の根幹を揺るがす暴挙ですまたこのロシアの侵略は世界のエネルギー食料供給にも混乱をもたらし当事国地域にとどまらない経済問題を表面化させていますこのような暴挙に対し国際社会が結束して毅然と対応し国際秩序を守り抜けるかが次の時代を占う試金石となりますではこのような時代において日本外交が取り組むべき課題とは何でしょうか私は外務大臣への就任時に日本外交の新しいフロンティアを切り開くことを宣明をいたしましたこれは新たな国際社会の現実すなわち国家間競争時代の始まりの中で日本そして世界の平和と繁栄にとって望ましい国際秩序を擁護し強化するための外交を展開,展開する決意を述べたものでしたこの半年間はその実現に向けて各国のカウンターパートとオンラインを含め積極的に会談を重ねまた先日のドイツでの G7 外相会談への出席をはじめ対面外交を再始動させていますここでいう国際秩序の根幹には自由民主主義人権法の支配といった普遍的価値がなければなりませんこれらの価値は戦後日本が一貫して擁護し今日の日本への信頼の基礎となっているものです岸田総理が外交の基本方針として掲げている三つの覚悟の筆頭もこの普遍的価値を守り抜く覚悟ですそしてまた力による一方的な現状変更の試みが平和と繁栄を破壊している現実を目前にして日本が擁護する国際秩序はこのような暴挙を許さない法の支配に基づく国際秩序である必要があります国家間競争の時代においても法の支配に基づく国際秩序への支持を広げていくことが世界の平和と繁栄のための不可欠の条件です日本外交がこうした国際秩序を擁護し強化していくためには第一に力による一方的な現状変更の試みを許さない新たな枠組みを再構築し国際社会における法の支配に基づく秩序への支持を拡大強化する努力を主導せねばなりませんそして第二に新たな現実に対応する日本自身の対応力や強靭性も強化していく必要がありますこの2点についてさらに具体的に述べていきましょう目下の世界において法の支配に基づく国際秩序の最大の脅威となっているのはロシアによるウクライナ侵略ですこの暴挙に対し国際社会が結束しロシアの一連の行動に高い代償が伴うことを示していけるかが新たな時代の進路にとって極めて重要です同時にこの時代の先を見据えた外交を進める上ではロシアの行動を止めることができなかった現在の秩序を支える既存の枠組みの問題点を直視し新たな暴挙を許さないための枠組みグローバルガバナンスのあり方を検討することも急務です現在国際社会においては今回のロシアによる侵略以外にも力による一方的な現状変更の試みや他国の政策の変更を基礎とした経済的威圧さらには偽情報の拡散やサイバー攻撃といった新たな課題が生じていますこれらは国連憲章にも裏付けられた国際社会の基本的ルールへの挑戦ですこうした挑戦に対しこれを予防抑止しひとたび事態が生じれば迅速に対処し影響を最小化させる仕組みを強化していくそのことが重要です第二次世界大戦の終結以降このグローバルガバナンスの中心を担ってきたのが国連ですそして今回の
国連安全保障理事会の常任理事国による露骨な侵略行為は国連や安全保障理事会に内在する限界を改めて露呈したにとどまらず国連憲章という大前提すら覆しかねない事態であり国連システムの在り方を見直す差し迫った必要性を示すものです。国連が今後もその普遍性と正当性を維持しながら国際社会の平和と安定課題の解決に貢献できるようにするためにはその限界を補い改革し強化しなければなりません。日本が重視する安保理改革はもちろんです。しかしそれだけではなく国連総会のさらなる活用紛争予防の視点の導入などを含め国連を全体として強化していくことが重要です。秩序を支える枠組みを強化すると同時に法の支配に基づく秩序そのものを強化していくことも重要です。秩序の強靭性とはそれを支える国々の数とその意志の強さです。したがって日本としては秩序を支える強い意志を共有する同志国との連携を強化しつつその輪を広げていく必要があります力による一方的な現状変更の試みへの対抗を共に主導するパートナーとして今回のロシアによる侵略に対し最も有効に対応してきたのは G7 です本年だけですでに7回というかってない異例の頻度で G7 外相会合が開催をされています先日のドイツでの会合ではウクライナ情勢のみならずインド太平洋における諸課題とさまざまな論点について G7 のカウンターパートと率直な議論を行いました。今後とも戦略的課題に対処していくにあたり G7 を中心としたパートナー国との連携を強化し共に指導力を発揮することが重要です。さらに G7 以外の同志国とも連携を深めていかねばなりません従来地域の安全保障については集団防衛を担う機構である NATO を有する欧州に対しアジア太平洋では各国が米国との二国間同盟を結ぶといういわゆるハブアンドスポークが地域の安全保障を担ってきました先月私は日本の外相として初めて NATO の外相会合に出席をしてきました私からは欧州とアジアの安全保障を切り離して論じることはできないことを強調し参加国とと認識を共有することができましたまた NATO のアジア太平洋のパートナーとの関係強化の取り組みこれを歓迎し日 NATO 間の具体的協力の推進も確認できました。このように地域をまたいだ安全保障協力さらには安全保障を超えた幅広い協力を日本が主導力を発揮する形で進めており共に国際秩序を支える意思を持つ同志国との連携強化に取り組んでいます最後に同志国を広げていく努力も必要です3月の国連総会緊急特別会合でのウクライナに対する侵略決議とウクライナに対する侵略の人道上の影響決議は共に140カ国以上という多数の賛成を得て採択されました国連憲章そしてそれによって支えられた秩序を擁護する意思が幅広い国々に共有されていることを示したものと言えるでしょうしかし賛成した国々の中には新型コロナの影響により苦境にある国やウクライナ情勢に起因する経済危機に苦しむ国も含まれていますこうした国々の主張に耳を傾けることも秩序への支持の裾野を広げていく上で欠かせません今日21世紀の国際社会に独自の世界観歴史観に基づき外国に政策や体制の変更を要求しそれが実現しないと見るや武力の行使も厭わない指導者が存在することは否定できない事実ですまた秩序への挑戦には至らないまでも既存の国際秩序に懐疑的であったり反発したりする国々も存在しますこのような国際社会で独善的な体制に対抗し幅広い支持を得る秩序とは普遍的な魅力を有する包摂的な秩序である必要があります近年日本が掲げ多くの国から支持を得ているビジョンが
自由で開かれたインド太平洋フォイップですその目的は地域全体の平和と繁栄を実現することです包括的かつ透明性のある方法でインド太平洋にルールに基づく国際秩序を確保するそしてそのような自由で開かれた秩序を発展させていくことを目指しています法の支配はまさにそれを支えるものです日本は各国の発展段階が異なることを前提とした上で全ての国にとって重要なことを一緒に発展させていくこうした考えのもとでビジョンを共有するいずれの国とも協力してフォイプの実現に向けた取り組みを進めています米国はこのビジョンを実現していく上で最も重要なパートナーですまたこのメッセージの収録後になりますが日米豪印でも今月24日にここ東京に米国豪州インドの首脳を招待して日本が日米合意首脳会合を主催し改めてフォイップのビジョンへのコミットメントを東京から発信しますフォイップを実現する上で要となるのが ASEAN です日本は一貫して ASEAN 一体性及び中心性を支持しています2019年には ASEAN はフォイップと本質的な原則を共有するインド太平洋に関する ASEAN アウトルックを採択しました今月の岸田総理の東南アジア歴訪でも FOIP の実現に向けた連携を各国の首脳と確認をしました私自身先に触れた NATO 外相会合において NATO のインド太平洋へのさらなる関与に向けた具体的協力を進めるとともに法の支配に基づく自由で開かれた国際秩序を確立するため、FOIP の実現に向けた連携を強化していくことを確認をしました。さらに、4月から5月にかけての中央アジアプラス日本対話第8回外相会合や、カザフスタン、ウズベキスタンおよびモンゴル訪問、フィジー・パラオ訪問といった機会にも、こうした国々との間で連携の強化を確認するなど、法の支配に基づく自由で開かれた国際秩序の維持・強化に向けた連携が着実に拡大をしています。日本が同志国とともに国際秩序の強化を主導していくには、我々の掲げる秩序そのものの普遍性にある魅力に加えて、世界の国々が直面している課題に対し、解決の道筋を示し、新たなルール・スタンダード作りを主導していくことも重要です。ロシアによるウクライナ侵略は世界各地でエネルギー食料需給の逼迫や急激な物価上昇をもたらしています。中東アフリカ諸国の中には穀物の多くをロシアやウクライナからの輸入に依存している国々もあり食料安全保障上の危機が生じています。日本は G7 や国際機関などとも連携しながら食料価格の安定化や脆弱な国への支援に取り組んでいます本件については先日の G7 外相会合でも議論しロシアによるウクライナに対する侵略戦争が世界の食料安全保障に及ぼす影響に関する G7 外相のコミットメントを確認をしました世界経済をめぐっては経済的威圧や不公正な貿易観光を廃止自由で公正な経済圏の拡大によって新型コロナからの回復新たな成長を実現していくことも重要です日本は自由貿易の旗振り役として TPP のハイスタンダードの維持や自由で開かれた多角的貿易体制の礎へたる WTO の再活性化に引き続き取り組んでいきますウクライナにおける危機に世界の関心が集まる一方で気候変動や国際保険といった人間の安全保障をめぐる課題に対する取り組みも歩みを緩めてはなりませんもともと脆弱性を抱える国々にとって新型コロナによるダメージがそしてロシアの侵略に起因する困難が加わったことで危機は一層差し迫ったものとなっていますこうした国々にとって我々がこれらの喫緊の課題に真剣なコミットメントを継続することが我々の掲げる秩序に対する信頼の基盤となります日本は
戦略的効果的な ODA の活用等を通じて持続可能な開発目標 SDGs の達成や自由で開かれたインド太平洋の実現に向けた取り組みを加速していきます。さらにロシアによる核兵器使用の可能性への言及や北朝鮮による引き続きの核ミサイル開発といった現実を受けて核兵器のない世界の実現に向けた国際社会の取り組みも困難に直面しています G7 外相も先の会合において本年中に開催される NPT 運用検討会議において意義のある成果を収めることが我々の優先事項であることを改めて表明しました日本は唯一の戦争被爆国として立場の異なる国々の間の橋渡しに努め日本の安全保障も考慮した現実的実践的な取り組みを積み重ねていきますここまで国際社会における秩序の強化を主導する日本外交の取り組みについて述べてきました一方で時代の転換期における変化の波は日本にも等しく押し寄せています続いては新たな時代に日本自身が抱えるリスクへの対応について見ていきましょう。今日日本を取り巻く脅威は多様化しており新たな現実に対応する対処力と強靭性の強化が喫緊の課題となっています。第一に東アジアジのの安全保障環境はその厳ししさを一層増しています。現在起きていることを俯瞰すればロシア中国北朝鮮という三つの課題に日本は直面をしていますロシアによるウクライナ侵略に対処しつついかなる主体にも一方的な現状変更の試みや挑発的な行動を進める機会の窓が開いたと誤認させてはなりません第二に拡大する情報空間におけるリスクの高まりがあります重要インフラに対するサイバー攻撃や SNS 等を通じた偽情報の拡散などハイブリッド戦の脅威は今回のウクライナ侵略で一層明らかとなってきていますとりわけ2014年のロシアによるクリミア併合や2016年の米国大統領選挙への介入疑惑を契機に広く知られるようになり現在のウクライナ危機をめぐって深刻な脅威として顕在化していますこれは有事平時を問わず民主主義社会の根幹に対する挑戦です第三に経済領域における安全安全保障リスクの拡大すなわち経済安全保障が挙げられます AI や量子といった最先端の技術も軍事転用されることで安全保障上のリスクとなり得ますまた新型コロナや今回のウクライナ危機により世界のサプライチェーンが持つ偏りが安定的な物流に脆弱性をもたらすことが明らかとなりましたエネルギーや食料といった基幹物資の供給の混乱は急激な国際価格の高騰をもたらし安全保障上もリスクを生じさせています経済的な依存関係を利用した威圧を躊躇しない国が存在する事実はこうしたリスクが一過性のものでないことを示していますこうした情勢に対応した日本の取り組みは着実に進展しています一層厳しさを増す安全保障環境においても日本外交安全保障の基軸が日米同盟であることには変わりはありません私自身就任以来ブリンケン国務長官との間で電話を含め類似の外相会談を実施するなど市場勝手なく強固なものとなっている日米同盟の抑止力対処力を一層強化すべく緊密に連携をしています同時,同時に日本自身の防衛力の抜本的な強化も必要ですそのために新たな国家安全保障戦略などの策定に取り組んでいます経済と安全保障を横断する課題についても日本は国家安全保障上の新たな課題である経済安全保障として広く認識し優先課題として取り組んでいます今次国会で成立した法案についてはあさっての小林大臣の講演に譲りたいと思いますが経済安全保障の取り組みには同盟国、同志国との連携も不可欠です外務省としては日米豪印の連携や G7 などの枠組みを活用し
東南アジア諸国を含む同志国との協力の拡大進化を図ってきていますこれは経済構造の自立性の確保や技術優位性の獲得といった経済安全保障のための取り組みが外交上も重要であるためです今般のウクライナ情勢を踏まえこのような同志国との連携協力はますます重要なものになっています引き続き安全保障政策や対外経済関係、国際法、これらを所管する立場から同盟国、同志国との連携強化や新たな課題に対応する国際規範の形成などに積極的に取り組んでいきますここまで変化する国際社会のいわば外在的なリスクへの対応を見てきましたしかし新たな時代の外交を進める上では我々自身の内に抱える脆弱性にも対処する必要があります新自由主義的な考え方のもとで実現した急激な経済成長は一方で国内の格差や貧困を拡大させ中間層を縮小させましたまたデジタル化の進展は生活の利便性の向上という恩恵とともにグローバル化の負の側面を加速化する結果を生み出しまた人々に自らが欲する情報のみを与えるという選択を許容することで分断を助長している側面もありますこうして生じる社会の分断は国民の理解を得て進めるべき民主主義政府の外交にも影響を及ぼしていますそしてここに権威主義的な考えが付け入る隙も生じていますさらにこうした分断が民主主義社会の弱さと見られることで生じるリスクも看過できません経済学の父と呼ばれるアダム・スミスは「神の見えざる手を説いた国富論の対になる著作として共感を基礎とする市民社会の秩序道徳に関する道徳感情論を表しました」すなわち資本主義経済は共感に支えられた健全な市民社会なくしては成立しないとしつつ過度の富の追求が社会の秩序や繁栄を毀損する危険に警鐘を鳴らしています資本主義経済の溶卵期から指摘されてきたこの難題の解決に今世界各国が取り組んでいます米国のバイデン政権はボトムアップとミドルアウトからの経済成長を掲げ大型の経済政策を通じて中間層の成長を支援しています EU でも新型コロナ後の経済復興計画である次世代の EU を通じ格差の是正を含む経済社会の変革も達成しようとしていますそして日本では岸田内閣のもと成長と分配の好循環による新しい資本主義によって持続可能な経済社会を実現する取り組みを進めています分厚い中間層を取り戻し国民の皆さんへの丁寧な説明を通じて国民と共にある外交安全保障を推進していきます二度の世界大戦を経験した人類はこのような惨禍を二度と繰り返すことのないよう紆余曲折を経ながらも法の支配に基づく国際秩序を築き上げてきました日本もまたこの秩序の下で第二次世界大戦からの復興と繁栄を実現してきました今再び世界は新たな時代への岐路に差し掛かっています不確実性を増す国家間競争の時代においてそれでも同志国の輪を広げ法の支配に基づく国際秩序を擁護していくことがその恩恵のもとで発展してきた日本の使命だと考えています日本は戦後一貫して平和国家としての道を歩みアジア太平洋地域や国際社会の平和と安定に貢献してきました人間の安全保障に立脚した途上国への開発協力を行うとともに国際的なルールづくりに取り組んできました軍縮不拡散や国際的な平和構築の取り組みにも貢献してきましたこうした努力により努力により得た世界からの信頼こそが新たな時代に日本外交がそのフロンティアを切り開く力の源泉となっています先人の思いと遺産を引き続きそこに同志国との連携をはじめとする新たな力を積み重ねることで
世界に平和と繁栄をもたらす秩序への支持を広げ強化していく外交を主導していく決意ですご清聴ありがとうございました Thank you very much. We are very grateful to hear from Foreign Minister Hayashi at this important period. Indeed, it provides a unique basis for framing this panel discussion on East Asia's shifting geopolitical and security landscape, and will focus particularly on what it means for the US Japan alliance. We're very fortunate to have with us four truly outstanding experts. I'm very much looking forward to hearing briefly from each of them and then undertaking a discussion followed by a question and answer period. In the interest of time, my introductions will be very brief. Thomas Christensen is Interim Dean and James T. Shotwell Professor of International Relations and Director of a program he co founded called China and the World Program at SIPA. Professor Christensen is one of our great experts in the United States on China and international security, an accomplished scholar who also served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs with responsibility for China, Taiwan, Mongolia from 2006 to 2008. Kenichiro Sasai is president of the Japan Institute of International Affairs. After a long and remarkable career in Japan's foreign ministry, indeed since 1974. He was ambassador of Japan to the United States from 2012 to 2018. His distinguished and illustrious diplomatic career includes many significant assignments as executive assistant to the Prime Minister, Director General of the Economic Affairs Bureau. Indeed, a period when I interacted with him a great deal when I was at USTR, Director General of the Asian and Oceania Affairs Bureau, and Vice Minister for Foreign Affairs. Susan Thornton is a senior fellow and visiting lecturer in law at the Yale University Law School, Paul Tsai China Center, and Director of the Forum on Asia Pacific Security. At the National Committee on American Foreign Policy and a non resident fellow at Brookings Institution. With almost three decades of experience with the US State Department in Eurasia and East Asia, she was acting Assistant Secretary for East Asian and Pacific Affairs at the Department of State until July 2018. And Michael Green is Senior Vice President for Asia, Japan Chair. And Henry A. Kissinger Chair at the Center for Strategic and International Studies and Director of Asian Studies at the Edmund A. Walsh School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. He is an expert on East Asian security and he served on the staff of the National Security Council from 2001 to 2005, first as Director for Asian Affairs and then as Special Assistant to the President for National Security Affairs and Senior Director for Asia. As you can see, this is a dream team of experts on China, Japan, Asia, international affairs, and security, each of whom will speak for a few minutes, outlining what each of them perceive to be the important. Geopolitical and security shifts underway, including with special relevance for the United States and Japan. Then I hope we'll have a chance to react to each other and bring in some questions. It is, of course, a time when the United States and Europe appear ever more unified in their approach to security in Europe, perhaps any time in recent memory in the aftermath of Russia's invasion in Ukraine. And when other countries in Europe are expressing interest in joining an expanded NATO, there is so much discussion about what role China might be willing to play vis a vis Russia, an intense interest on what this conflict means for the Asia Pacific security. We have just heard a great series of remarks from the foreign minister on this. I'd like to now turn it over to Professor Christensen. To start our panel. 
Tom, the mic is yours. Thanks very much, Merritt. Um, it's a great honor to be here on a panel with Ken Sasai, Mike Green, and Susan Thornton, with whom I've worked uh, over many years. And I wanted to speak today about the rise of China and the challenge for the US-Japan alliance um, in the context of uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine and in the context of cross-strait relations, which I still think is the most likely source of conflict between great powers in East Asia. Uh, first of all, on the rise of China, uh, China is still not a pure competitor of the United States around the world, but it's able to fight with great intensity in its own neighborhood. And unfortunately, that neighborhood is very far from the United States, and it's very close to our allies and partners and our bases there. And that makes it extremely difficult to do things like come to Taiwan's defense if the mainland were to attack it. And the U.S. and its partners like Japan need to adjust their military strategy accordingly uh, to be... Uh, stronger, to be more mobile, and to be more flexible. But at the same time, I'll argue we don't want to change our basic political strategy in the security field, which has been successful and could continue to be successful into the future. Um, that's the essence of deterrence, to mix credible threats and, and political assurances together. And I think we still need to do that at the most basic level. I focus on Taiwan and cross-strait relations because I know that there are other uh, potential flashpoints in the region, like the South China Sea and the East China Sea. But it is my opinion that the nature of those, uh, those uh, disputes is such that they are more manageable and less likely to lead to great power conflict. Uh, controlling large swaths of sea is difficult. There are a few people out there to, uh, to cause aggravation among, e among each other. Um, and there's really no first mover advantage to try to seize things uh, before other actors get there. So cross-strait relations seem the most dangerous because there are people involved and there are politics involved. And increasingly there is a, a premium on either attacking first or reacting quickly to an attack uh, in the cross-strait context uh, that makes that situation increasingly dangerous in light of China's growing capability of projecting power off of its shore particularly in its own neighborhood. Um, so deterrence will become more difficult over time. And for it to work, Beijing needs to see cross-strait conflict as highly costly to it, but at the same time needs to see cross-strait conflict as unnecessary politically. And that's the theme of my, uh, my talk. And I think the Russian invasion of Ukraine uh, really creates some interesting dynamics on that score. First of all, on the credible threat side of the, of the deterrence equation, I think the Russian invasion of Ukraine must be giving Beijing some pause, uh, especially about an invasion scenario against Taiwan. Uh, Putin was overconfident. He clearly believed his generals. And I think Xi Jinping has to wonder whether he can believe that his generals can deliver uh, the types of outcomes that they might promise him uh, before a conflict. Land is easier to invade uh, than an island across a body of water and across air. Um, so that should also give some pause, at least for a invasion scenario. Um, and one of the things that must have stru struck the Chinese analysts is that Russia was unable to establish information dominance early in the conflict. And that's something uh, that Chinese security analysts have emphasized as necessary, uh, particularly if the United States were to come into the conflict. Um, there's a sanctions regime internationally against Russia that has to give China pause, and they have to worry about getting caught up in such a sanctions regime themselves. So the U.S. will need, I believe, to be able to fight from multiple locations, and Japan will be key to that formula. Um, we'll need access to multiple places. We'll need more larger um, uh, quantities of uh, long-range strike weapons. Um, and we need to be able to fire them from multiple locations with mobile forces. And for Taiwan's sake, it needs to learn the lessons of asymmetric resistance taught by the Ukrainians, um, mobile coastal defenses, air defenses, uh, uh, sophisticated sea mine strategies, and a stronger reserve potential for their military, I believe. But I think we need to avoid simplistic analogies between the Russian invasion of Ukraine and a potential uh, cross-strait conflict. First of all, I think the lens that this is simply an issue of democracy versus authoritarianism, and this is uh, cross-strait uh, relations are just another example of that, is too simplistic. That is definitely part of the equation, but it's not the entire equation. So I think enhancing Taiwan security is a very good idea, 
um, and giving them larger stockpiles for a potential conflict is a good idea. Um, but the idea of creating strategic clarity for the United States, which has been pushed by the American president in what appears to be a gaffe uh, in Tokyo and former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's uh, writings on the subject, I think is a bad idea. And I'll close with that. Why do I think that? I think that strategic clarity by the United States is unnecessary for deterrence because I think PLA and Chinese civilian leaders all plan for US intervention if they attack Taiwan. They expect US intervention if they attack Taiwan, they plan for it and they will calculate that into their calculations regardless of the US position. But anything that seems to restore the US Republic of China uh, alliance uh, that existed during the Cold War would be anathema to Chinese politics and would be more likely to actually cause a conflict uh, than to deter one. Uh, there are various reasons for this. One is that an unconditional commitment by the United States would feed badly into Taiwan politics in the lead up to the 2024 election. Polls suggest that uh, uh, citizens of Taiwan are much more likely to support uh, pro-independence uh, political positions if they believe the United States has an unconditional commitment uh, to the island security. I think China will see Taiwan under those circumstances as an issue much like Secretary Austin described Ukraine for the United States, which is a tool with which to weaken China rather than a political conflict across the Taiwan Strait that the United States insists uh, is settled peacefully. So for these reasons, I believe that strategic clarity would actually be a force for undercutting deterrence rather than enhancing it. But a much stronger US military position, a more flexible, a more mobile one in coordination with Japan, with the Philippines, and I would hope South Korea down the road would be a very good element for deterrence as long as it was accompanied by political moderation that makes it seem unnecessary for the mainland to use force against Taiwan. I didn't talk about a couple of things because I'm out of time. Uh, unfortunately, there is a blockade scenario for the mainland that is very difficult to counter and makes uh, the island situation of Taiwan actually more fraught, not, let, not safer. And there are other aspects of US policy in the region that I think Japan can actually help the United States recover from. Uh, I think we've been too weak on trade and economics, and I think we've been too weak in competing with China in the development sphere. And I think Japan is ahead of the United States on both the Trans-Pacific Partnership and on development aid uh, to Southeast Asia and China's neighbors. And I, I hope that Japan can lead the United States in a more constructive direction so that the United States can compete more effectively in those areas. And I'll stop there. And I think uh, I'll turn it back over to Merritt. I think I've used up my time and I look forward to the question and answer. Thank you very much, Tom. Let me now invite Ambassador Sasai to offer his remarks. Thank you very much uh, uh, for having me on this uh, program. <clears throat> nice to see all friends, all good American friends on this program. Uh, let me uh, focus uh, a bit uh, on the uh, President Biden's visit to Tokyo. We know all the issues, they are familiar, but I think there was uh, good uh, progress and success uh, by the President's visits. And so I wanna focus on that one. And, and because, you know, looking back on the history of Japan-US alliance and collaboration, we have come a long way. You know, obviously this Russian invasion of Ukraine is, is the most serious concern at this moment, globally, regionally, and also bilaterally uh, for countries like Japan. And also the us with the biggest challenge uh, for, for the United States and Japan in terms of alliance management on top of uh, North Korea and Chinese uh, expansion in the region. But I think the, uh, the, this impact of Ukraine invasion of Russia to Japan is enormous. I mean, uh, you know, this is uh, the same as the Russian invasion into Afghan late in 1970s, you know, at the time Japan was debating whether we are a member of the West, you know, you can't believe it, right? And we are still debating, we are part of the West. 
No, we don't argue on that one anymore. When there was a Russian invasion to Crimea, we are on the edge of G7, but we are on the edge kind of, not in the forefront or in the middle of a joint effort to, to cope with the situation. Now, for the first time in the history of our relationship vis-a-vis uh, Russia and also the alliance with the United States and G7, we are full-fledged partner try to work both in terms of uh, you know coping with uh, Russian invasions uh, <clears throat> and supporting Ukraine and also joining the sanction full place. So uh, I think the, uh, the this uh, Russian invasion to Ukraine is making Japan aware once again the role we need to play in the global context. For many years, uh, we have been talking about Japan-U.S. global partnership. That was, uh, of course, the goal. But but reality, if you look at the reality, it, it, it's a part of the goal. Not really we are striding as such. But uh, I think for the first time in history, this global partnership is beginning to show uh, the real sort of status of the situation. Having said that one, um, <clears throat> This Ukraine, you know, situation is is many way, uh, you know, solidifying not only NATO alliance but also Japan U.S. alliance too. And uh, the question is that uh, could we really sustain the, all these competitions of, of uh, uh, sustaining the sacrifice? A sacrifice means economic sacrifice. This impact is great on our own economy and global economy. And all the, the third, third developing countries, you know, uh, uh, and the Russian economy is also shaken. So we have to compete in, in the battle to sustain our own economy. And that, that's the first question. And the second question is that uh, is there any exit, a way out uh, from this Ukraine situation? So a political solution is not clear. And how long does it take? We don't know. And the most serious one is that we all know that there is a danger of uh, nuclear uh, war to the extent that uh, Putin could go crazy. I hope that would not be the case, but still I think we're talking about it. So I think there is an enormous alert uh, to the Japanese public and the government that this is not simply the European issue anymore. This is our own issue. That is the first important point. And the second one is that how is this impacting upon Asia Pacific and in the Pacific vision? Uh, you know, the, the uh, doctor, uh, uh, Professor Chris Denson uh, made some remarks on the impact of Russia and invasion uh, to uh, uh, China, especially in the context of Taiwan Strait. And I, I uh, to some extent, I agree with him. What is a lesson for China? You know, uh, I think the, the uh, President Biden's remarks in the press conference in Tokyo this time, uh, you know, uh, somebody said that uh, he deviated from the traditional positions of the United States, this, uh, you know, uh, fuzzy policy and ambiguity policy. Uh, and, uh, and I took this one as expressions of presidents, uh, you know, uh, thinking, uh, uh, you know, uh, in the context of, uh, uh, you know, uh, American position on Ukraine, uh, should America be more clear, uh, you know, that when there is a unilateral uh, Chinese uh, attack on Taiwan, America is ready. I think uh, uh, that could be provocative, but you, you don't have to say it. But uh, I think uh, uh, funny can uh, as Dr. Christensen said that uh, uh, you know militarily and, and the government are preparing for also for the future contingency. So I think the public should know that uh, we we need to prepare, especially for for the Japanese problem. And and for for many years Taiwan issue is a kind of a taboo. People are not talking much about the danger involved there. I think for that one. Uh, I don't know whether the U.S. government would sustain uh, this ambiguity policy 
in the years to come, how the Chinese threat is more in the forefront. I think that's subject to debate. Uh, the another impact on on, on Ukraine invasion uh, into uh, <clears throat> Russia is a change of Japanese uh, defense and security policy, and uh, you know uh, there is a, a statement made by by Japanese Prime Minister uh, Kishida uh, on, on the effort to drastically expand its defense uh, defense expenditure and also the uh, the options uh, will be considered including uh, uh, the uh, counter attack capacity I and mean, capabilities uh, and these are subject to debate but still i think there is a very strong will expressed on the part of the japanese government that uh, we will look into this one we we need to try to work this out and also there is more sort of a focus on the extended deterrence uh, this extended deterrence uh, had been there for some time, but for the first time, this became the major focal point of debate in, in Japan. I think uh, people need to know what is this uh, extended deterrence, what, it, what does this mean in the context of uh, threat coming from North Korea and China and, and, and resurgence of Russian threat. I think uh, these the, 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 the are a very important moment uh, for us uh, to deeply uh, think and, and look what should be the best we can do uh, to cope with the emerging uh, and also increasing uh, threat around us. Uh, obviously, uh, this, this uh, Russian actions also uh, uh, impacted on Japanese policy toward Russia bilaterally. And our peace treaty talks and, and Northern Territory talks uh, obviously shock. And, uh, and I, I think the issue is more on the national security. I think uh, in the ongoing uh, policy review, I think the, the, the resurgence of Russian issue will be a uh, uh, integral part of the process. And I think there should be more focus on, on, on the security side. And, and also the, the uh, another important part of the security environment is uh, is a North Korean, and uh, you know uh, uh, there was a, a ballistic missile shot this morning uh, by North Korea. I don't know whether they tried to do it uh, immediately after President Biden visited Japan, and also Russia and China are also you know are sending the uh, you know uh, airplanes, military airplanes around us and also showing the signal that they are determined to resist whatever the strengths and the, you know, collaboration and defense collaboration among us. So uh, the, uh, but, but I think the important part of, uh, of the agreement this time was that uh, uh, there was a good understanding that uh, we need to improve the relationship with our OK in order to strengthen uh, the, this triangular uh, partnership Japan, US, uh, and ROK to counter the increasing North Korean threat. I hope that the new Korean government and Japanese government would be good enough uh, to work on uh, better uh, solutions on, on the pending issues. Uh, now, finally, uh, on the uh, Asia Pacific, the Foip and Quad and I IPF issues, um, I think the, the, it was good for the what leaders met face to face uh, a second time, and also great uh, to see, uh, you know, Australian new Australian uh, leader came to join, and, and also India uh, showed uh, its its fundamental position uh, to be a part of, uh, you know, Quad and 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 delivering the joint message kind of, uh, including the serious security concern uh, coming from China. And others, and although India's position on Ukraine is obviously slightly different uh, from the other three, but it doesn't mean that uh, India uh, could be out of uh, you know our own uh, partnership. I think it, India continues to be important in spite of their own position on the on, on the issues. And on the IPF issues, I think there is a, a nice try and a good initiative taken by the United States. And we all support it and welcome it because I think we need America. 
We need American economic presence and American leadership. Although there is a, uh, some concern that, uh, you know, uh, could this be really, you know, attractive enough uh, to Asian nations uh, because there is a lack of tariff negotiation and market issues. But still, I think all the supply chain issues and, and high tech issues, uh, there is a marriage for us uh, to work together with the United States, especially because Asian uh, ASEAN countries, we need them. And as uh, Minister Hayashi said, we need to keep ASEAN as an integral part of our uh, regional peace and security. So for that reason, I think there is a good chance for us to work individually and collectively with ASEAN countries to make uh, this agreement uh, or this framework work. Uh, I would stop here. Thank you very much, Ambassador Sosai. Thank you for those excellent remarks and they will provoke, I'm sure, much important discussion. Let me now invite Susan Thornton to offer her thoughts. Well, thank you so much, Mira. And it's so great to be with so many good friends and colleagues here on this panel. And um, it's my honor to be with the Columbia Business uh, Group and the audience here. Um, I'm going to mostly focus on the effects of the Russian invasion on U.S. foreign policy in Asia and, and the international diplomatic environment. I think Russia's invasion is really a gut punch for U.S. foreign policy. And I have to say that for Europe, it's more like a 9-11 event. Um, for the U.S., you know, it was already hard coming out of the Trump isolationist period where the U.S. kind of went into a bit of retreat from the world. We had, of course, our domestic political dysfunctions, and then we had COVID-19. So we were already um, moving and trying to deal with multiple different crises. Um, but now the U.S. and the West are overwhelmingly focused on Russia, Ukraine. Uh, resources are really flowing uh, in that direction of that crisis, as usually happens in, in the U.S., uh, when we have a crisis. So we basically recently approved $54 billion in aid to Ukraine, which is happens to be more than twice the annual budget of the US Agency for International Development. Um, you know, the problems with Russia are still escalating. I know Ambassador Sasai said, we don't know how long this is gonna go on. Um, that's true, but it's going to go on for some time, and it is likely to hobble uh, institutions and the global economy, as has been mentioned. Um, you know, we have also the lingering effects of COVID-19, and if you look at what's been happening in international institutions that are trying to deal with the economic recovery from COVID-19, like the G20, like the recent APEC ministerial, you know, those institutions that are so important for managing these issues and so important to uh, countries that are concerned about their economy and their development, you know, have been kind of besieged by this Russia-Ukraine uh, conflict issue and had walkouts, et cetera. Um, and those are not the issues that they're meant to be dealing with, but it's infecting everything. Um, I think the problems, um, uh, with other pending crises are also looming in the background. Uh, North Korea has been mentioned, of course. Um, there's also Iran. Um, we have a negotiation going on to try to uh, put Humpty Dumpty back together in terms of the nuclear agreement there. But if it doesn't work, uh, we're liable to have a crisis there as well. And we all know North Korea um, at any moment could emerge as a crisis. So it's not impossible that we would have three crises going on at once. Um, and I'm not even mentioning, although Tom Christensen, of course, talked a lot about um, you know, a potential crisis with Taiwan, which I, I hope isn't as emergent as Iran and North Korea, which I would be more worried about in an urgent way. Um, you know, I think the Biden administration is tried really hard to show commitment to the Indo-Pacific through this period of having to deal with all these other problems. Um, they've had four quad leader meetings, um, including the most recent one in Tokyo, which is great. 
Um, President Biden got to Asia uh, finally, which was good. And the ASEAN leaders came to Washington DC for their summit, uh, which was great. Um, but this is going to be very difficult to sustain, I think, um, without some kind of crisis in Asia, which we, I don't think, hope for. So um, I think this Russia crisis is really likely to drag everyone along in its wake. I expect U.S.-China relations to get worse um, as this Russia crisis drags on. Um, I think we also, no one has mentioned yet, but I think China's internal situation is likely to deteriorate as well. Uh, given that they are now grappling with what many of us grappled with earlier in terms of the COVID-19 pandemic and all of the sort of uh, measures taken in reaction to try to deal with it, economic troubles, you know, uh, political fragility, et cetera. And I think China will provide this lifeline to Russia, which as the crisis drags on with Ukraine will become, you know, more and more problematic in the eyes of the West. and will uh, ratchet up the tensions between China and certainly the US, if not others. Um, you know, none of these crises are what the rest of Asia or the global South want to be focused on. They're worried about, I think, as the minister said, you know, their domestic developments, economic instability, um, you know, transnational threats like climate change are very high on the agenda. And we saw the new Australian prime minister refer frequently to that issue. Um, and I think the knock on effects of the Ukraine crisis for the economies is going to be devastating for some countries and they're quite worried about it. Um, and I think this is going to make it really hard for Japan and the US to navigate all of these exogenous crises um, and get multilateral support outside of the G7. The minister referred frequently to the G7 support and like minded countries, but um, I think we need to be dealing with more than just the G7. And uh, frankly, the framing of democracies versus autocracies is a little bit inhibiting in this respect. I mean, you're leaving half the world on the field by alienating them with this labeling language. And I'm, I'm not a fan as a former diplomat of that. Um, I do think that we need to keep showing leadership and priority on economic recovery and climate change is going to be very important. Uh, international institutions are being neglected and weakened. I was glad to hear the minister talk about the WTO. We need to preserve as much of the institutional mechanisms that we have built over the last 70 years as we possibly can while we work to try to reform um, and add and strengthen in other areas. But um, you know, throwing the baby out with the bathwater is, is not going to be helpful to where we're headed now, I'm afraid. Thanks. Thank you very much, Susan, for those uh, comprehensive uh, remarks. Let me now invite uh, Mike Green to offer his thoughts. Um, thank you very much, Merritt. I really enjoyed um, the previous panelists' comments. I think you heard some very rich um, uh, analysis of the implications of the Ukraine crisis for uh, cross-strait stability, for Japan's diplomacy, and from Susan just now for the international system and diplomacy as we know it. Um, and I agree with almost all of it, and it's all pretty depressing. So I'm going to end on a slightly upbeat note and focus on another trend we've seen that's quite pronounced, um, not just with the Ukraine invasion, really beginning a decade ago, and that's the growing alignment of uh, major maritime democracies around the world to shore up uh, the international order as it comes under stress. And in particular, the central role played by Japan, um, which I think is important given the sponsorship of this uh, conference. And to do that, let me wind the clock back a decade to 2012-13. And you'll all recall that this was the year that Xi Jinping was proposing to the Obama administration a new model of great power relations the, the Daguo great power was designed to demote Japan or India, Australia, and really try to frame the international system in Asia as a bipolar uh, uh, system where the US and China had to split differences to uh, preserve peace. And it was very unpopular in Japan and in Australia and India, and especially Taiwan. But the reality was that in polls taken by the Chicago Council on Global Affairs that year, uh, a plurality of Americans thought that was the right approach to deal with a rising China. They said the best approach is to work with China 
even if it hurts our relations with Japan and allies. And the Obama administration was quite divided on this idea of a bipolar condominium of trying to work things through in a new model of great power relations. But elsewhere as well, um, Australia, you know, was debating Hugh White's book, China Choice, and um, uh, prominent politicians in the parliament were running their speeches by the Chinese embassy to make sure they didn't upset Beijing. It was very hard to have a transatlantic dialogue on Asia that was not all about China. Um, all right, 10 years later, where are we? Well, the Chicago Council on Global Affairs polling now uh, shows that well over two thirds of Americans say the way to deal with a rising China is to work more closely with Japan and our allies. Um, the signature foreign policies in the region for the Biden administration and the Trump administration are initiatives that Prime Minister Abe introduced in 2013, 14, and 15. Um, the Quad, we just had a Quad summit hosted by Prime Minister Kishida, the free and open Indo-Pacific concept, um, and um, strengthening uh, solidarity within the G7, as we heard from Foreign Minister Hayashi, and between NATO and US allies in Asia. Um, and the Lowy Institute in Australia in 2019 in its, um, in its uh, annual power survey of Asia concluded that Japan had emerged as the leader of the liberal order in Asia. Um, and um, governments, not just in the United States, but in Australia, in France, in the Netherlands, in Indonesia, were you know, articulating their own Indo-Pacific strategies and rejecting the idea that this was a bipolar system, uh, that multipolarity gave them agency and Japan really uh, showed the way. And in Australia, we just had an election, the labor leader, Prime Minister Albanese, uh, brings his party back to power for the first time in a decade. And if you heard his comments when he traveled uh, on his first day in office to Tokyo to join the Quad, it sounded little different from his predecessors in terms of aligning with the US and Japan, uh, with the Quad, with AUKUS, with the UK, uh, and, 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 and dealing with a tougher China. So how did this happen? The gold medal does not go to Abe Shinzo. The gold medal for this transformation goes to Xi Jinping. Uh, who, um, who, who made this all possible. I'd say Abe gets the silver medal. Um, how far does this alignment go? You know, you're, you're hearing um, in Japan, politicians talking about a, a NAPDO, a North Atlantic Pacific Treaty Organization. Uh, I don't think that's going to happen. Um, the US treaty system in Asia was by design bilateral, not a collective security uh, organization like NATO. Um, and as everyone on this panel knows well, most of the treaty allies of the United States trade more with China than with the United States. Foreign direct investment is a different story, which is overwhelmingly more about the United States uh, than China. But this is not the Soviet Union. Decoupling is not an option. But I think the trend lines will continue uh, because I don't see Xi Jinping changing course. Um, there are differences. I'd say the most significant difference right now is over trade policy. And while President Biden, you know, served up a very you know, delicious looking Indo-Pacific economic framework in Tokyo, um, uh, th there really wasn't much protein in it. Um, and uh, Japan meanwhile has from 2012 to today transformed its role in rulemaking and international economic statecraft. In 2012, about 16% of Japan's trade was covered by trade agreements. Uh, today it's about 85%. So huge transformation in Japan uh, leading, including on the CPTPP, the successor to TPP today. Um, so I don't think this is a NATO, but I think it's increasingly uh, a trend we're going to see, growing alignment. And I think Japan is, is in many ways uh, setting the course. Um, the upbeat note I'll end on, what does this mean for US-China relations? People used to fret 10 years ago about two blocks creating more tension in US-China relations. And I would posit it's the opposite. I think the increasing influence of Japan and Australia and others on US strategy uh, and the Biden administration's clear emphasis on allies and partners gives those allies and partners more agency. And what do they want? As the LDP National Security Commission just declared, the most hawkish part of the party, Japan wants a productive relationship with China. So does Australia, so does Canada, so does NATO. And so I think the um, alignment of, of allies and democracies around the China problem is actually going to have a stabilizing effect on US-China relations on the whole, uh, not a destabilizing effect. So Merritt, I've tried to end on an upbeat note because we heard some pretty realistic and pretty dire trend lines, but, but hopefully that brightened the mood a little bit. Thanks.
Well, thank you very, very much. Um, I um, am uh, going to ask a question or two, invite colleagues to ask each other uh, questions if you so wish, and then open it up uh, to our uh, audience to please. So please send your uh, comments or your questions in the Q&A function uh, if you are watching uh, this video. I guess I'd like to ask a, a first question. We've heard some very uh, big picture comments and I think conceptual framework by, by each of our panelists. But we've also heard some specific suggestions and one of those uh, ambassadors society, I'd like to invite you to comment further. Um, you know, you spoke about uh, improved uh, trilateral relations between uh, Japan and South Korea, uh, uh, perhaps with the role of the United States. And I wonder if you could say more about what you think the next steps should be uh, you know, to uh, normalize and improve bilateral relations and strengthen trilateral relations, uh, including with the United States. Well, thank you, uh, Mary, uh, on this trilateral relationship uh, uh, among the three uh, countries. I think this had been on agenda for, for many years. There were, had been up and down in this history. And uh, often the case, I think the, uh, the difficulty comes from this bilateral between Tokyo and Seoul uh, in relation to the issues of, of the history and the past. And it's still, you know, uh, there. And uh, especially over the couple of years, I think uh, in spite of all the agreement in the past, uh, our okay government to uh, come back to that, uh, basically because of a domestic, uh, you know, court decision and so forth. But uh, I think it, 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 there is a moment of a, a transition and change. If you look back at the history, I think whenever there is a new government coming in, I think that there is some efforts taken uh, to improve the relationship. I, 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 I would imagine uh, that uh, this uh, new South Korean government would try to improve the relationship with Japan. They have already sent out the signal that, uh, and I think Japanese government is taking this signal seriously. And what is important is to try to work out some formula uh, to move forward, uh, to settle on some of the pending issues uh, 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 before us. And it is easy to say and difficult to do. Uh, and uh, I can't really uh, elevate too much expectation, uh, but uh, I think uh, you know, there is a chance uh, for the Japanese government to have a good informal conversation first, and rather than going to a public debate. I mean, when there was a Kim Tae-jun of Obuchi declaration back in 1998, there had been a six months, uh, you know, informal period of discussion before going to the public for the full fledged the recovering program. And so uh, uh, without uh, too much uh, confrontation or more, or going to the public debate on the difficult issues. Uh, I think the informal discussion is already underway. Uh, I hope that that could work out some tangible result. And, and if that is the case, I think there could be a leaders meeting and uh, taking uh, uh, you know, the uh, various occasions. And uh, uh, the Japanese government sent out uh, the foreign minister to the inauguration you know, uh, uh, for, for the uh, new uh, Korean uh, president, uh, and, and I think there was a debate that they sh should uh, Prime Minister go. I think there was some hesitation on that one because we weren't quite sure how that would be uh, workable for the tangible result. So I think there should be some moment to, to work closely and, uh, and, uh, and uh, that the way it should be. And the uh, United States could help and support in, in a benign way not really getting into uh, too much into the specific, uh, you know, issues of the thorn. And uh, as we know, uh, uh, both Tokyo and so uh, Seoul are asking United States to support their own positions. America should not be somewhere between any court. I think the best way is to encourage both parties to, con to continue to work out some amicable solutions. And 
that is necessarily because uh, uh, America need to cope with the North Korean threat. I think in parallel with that, there should be some uh, uh, more serious discussion that should be taking place uh, on, on how to deal with North Korea. I think the, the, uh, the history of the negotiation, the history of failure, to be honest, we couldn't stop North Korea developing their missiles and nuclear weapons that continue to go on. And I, I think there is a reason for that. I don't really get into all the detail, but we are basically dictated uh, by the uh, North Korean initiative rather than we take the initiative and to lead and more reactive you know, uh, positions we have been taking. So th this time around, I think we need to uh, be uh, proactive in, in, in trying to work out uh, in the, the combinations of uh, uh, carrot and sticks. And uh, for the moment, I think we need to make sure that we are de determined to increase our own defense and the capability to counter North Korean threat. And without that one, I think North Korea would think that we are simply wishing for the amicable negotiated settlement. I think that will not be working. So I think we need to show some strengths and teeth before getting into serious debate. But in doing so, I think we also need to offer the comprehensive long-term objectives, what North Korea can get. And we all know the element. I think the issue is more how we would, uh, you know, uh, uh, make all these uh, sequential uh, combinations uh, of carrot and sticks. And then I think uh, we could come back to the more serious questions. I think uh, and, uh, in the past negotiation, we stopped on the issues of uh, verifications. You know, uh, even if there is a good agreement, we, we were not really successful for that. So I think we should resume the talks and uh, there could be a chance for that. Thank you very much. Um, you know, if I, I think I, I understood uh, Susan to anticipate that U.S.-China relations were likely to uh, continue to worsen. Um, and uh, I think, Tom, you mentioned, uh, you know, the difficult and awkward position that China is in. And I think, uh, Mike, you spoke more by implication of what U.S. relations with China were likely to be. I want to invite each of you to just offer one thought on uh, where you think uh, the relationship could be headed and what the US and, and Japan could do about it in, in concrete steps. Uh, Susan, would you like to start? Well, sure. I mean, I, I think um, it, bilaterally, I think that the relationship is in a very difficult place and I don't see many openings or mechanisms for turning that around at the moment. Um, I think we've gotten to a pretty bad place, but I'm encouraged by what Mike said there at the end that he thinks that the influence of our partners is going to be helpful in bringing us around. I mean, I, one of the problems, of course, is that, you know, it's been very hard for the U.S. to engage on economic discussions with China, which is through thick and thin, even during the lowest lows of the Trump administration, we had economic discussions going with China. We don't even have that now. So, um, you know, restoring some connections diplomatically on issues where, you know, people that work on technical issues to make progress can talk to each other is very important, but we really don't have many channels for that going now. And that's something that I find very worrisome. We tend to be communicating through the press, um, which is not ever a very good way to do it in U.S.-China relations. Thank you. Tom? I mean, you've spoken about the risks of what was said by President Biden, but is this the moment to try to reframe it, restate it, or are there other more concrete measures you think would be constructive? Um, well, I think I, I wanted to return to something that Susan said, which I think is really important about the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which is that uh, because Xi Jinping got, I, I believe, snookered by, by Putin, uh, be, by creating this very strong partnership right before the invasion. Um, he's in a very difficult position. And I agree with Susan that this war is likely to continue for years. Uh, um, I don't know if she would go that far, but I'm willing to go that far. And it's going to become more and more costly to Russia, particularly as the Europeans get alternative sources of energy. So the temptation for China to backfill sanctions is going to get stronger. 
So it's going to be really incumbent on the United States and Japan and like-minded states to stay together on this, to try to dissuade China from playing that role through a concerted effort. It's going to be difficult because uh, other countries are even more dependent on uh, economic relations with China than the United States is. And that's the negative side of the equation. But I, I tried to finish my comments in the spirit of Mike's comments, which is, I think that Japan is a leader in, in, in various ways in the region that the United States should take uh, some courage from. Uh, I think across administrations, we have dropped the ball on economics. And economics are so important to the region, particularly in Southeast Asia, that if we're competing for influence with China, um, I, I would hope that Japan could convince American leaders who emphasize the importance of the alliance system, and Korea as well could do the same, that emphasize the importance of the alliance system as a source of strength and leverage in dealing with the rising China. And I believed in that my entire career, um, that the economic piece can't be left out of that, that you really can't have an Asia Pacific alliance and partnership based strategy without a strong economic component. And I believe Japan is currently head, head and shoulders ahead of the United States uh, on pushing multilateral economic cooperation, on pushing uh, uh, development loans and development aid in a way that poses a, a, a different alternative for countries that might otherwise be entirely reliant on China. Um, so I, I would hope that that would be the case. And I'm not so nationalistic that I don't, uh, that, that I'm unwilling to recognize that our allies and partners in the spirit of Mike Green's comment can provide the United States adult supervision because we can be very brash and very destructive uh, because of domestic politics and other reasons, particularly on, on policies towards East Asia and towards China. Um, and I think that our allies can be a stabilizing force. Um, so I agree with Mike on that score as well. Thank you. Let me invite uh, both Mike and, and Sosai san to offer a comment before turning to questions. Well, I, um, uh, I am, uh, to, be, to be honest, pessimistic uh, about the next five years or so. Um, you know, on the trade uh, and economic piece, we do have to do everything Tom said, but a significant faction in this administration and a significant faction in the previous administration that aren't going away from either Republican or Democratic politics um, believes that trade agreements are bad and that um, trade agreements hurt workers and hurt the uh, United States. Uh, there's a, another faction in both the Republican and Democratic parties that says no, trade agreements bring prosperity and strong alliances. Public opinion polling shows the majority of the American people are with the latter group believing that trade is good and that, and that economic engagement is good. But the politics, especially presidential politics of Ohio, Michigan, and Pennsylvania mean that um, it takes a lot of political courage to stand up and say, no, we're going to push this through the way Presidents Obama, Bush, Clinton, and all previous presidents did. So I'm a little pessimistic for the near term, but not the long term, because opinion polls show that especially younger Americans get it. Uh, and I'm pessimistic about US-China relations because Xi Jinping, when he's you know, when, when he when he when he sees a problem, he gets a bigger hammer. You know, he's you know he's criticized for coercion. What does he do? You know, he pushes for security pact with the Solomon Islands. Hard to argue that the security China gets from that is worth the way they have galvanized Australia, New Zealand, uh, France, UK, and the United States and Japan to deal with the problem. And if you look at Xinjiang, Hong Kong, um, dual circulation technology policy, Xi Jinping is consistently begging, getting a bigger hammer to hit even harder. Um, so the US Indo-Pacific strategy that was recently published is interesting to me because it emphasizes that the US strategy is to shape the environment around China, not to shape China. And as Tom would know well, we, this is the first time in memory, certainly since Nixon, uh, we have not had an actual strategy to shape China's choices. The administration's given up on that. Um, and so um, that's where I think the allies come in because they want to shape China's choices and they can't do it alone. They'll be pushing us to come up with trade and other strategies that help to do that. Thank you very much. Uh, so Sasson, would you care to comment? I, 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 yeah, yes. I, I want to be a, a bit more optimistic about uh, US-China. <laughs> <Just laughs> 
of course, it, it's going to be very difficult. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, after all these uh, allies and friends line up to compete with China, I think uh, uh, in the short run, it could be difficult. But in the medium term, I think there is a good chance uh, for the United States to, to work out the bilateral dialogue. Susan said it's difficult, that is true. But uh, for example, I think if the uh, Talif against China uh, imposed by the uh, previous uh, administration uh, could be a subject of, of uh, negotiation. It could be, uh, you know, leveling down and give some incentive for China to look into and, and to give some uh, opportunity to, to have a talk. I mean, so there could be different damage. And also, uh, in, you know, Susan talked about domestic uh, politics. For Chinese domestic politics, the relationship with the United States is an integral part of the, the domestic politics. So I think all these difficulties with the United States is not necessarily, you know, uh, uh, good in terms of their own domestic politics. And in the longer term, I think uh, uh, there is a debate about Chinese economic resilience. And uh, so there could be some opportunity for them to look into more of the uh, amicable relationship with the United States for the sake of their own domestic economy and also the supremacy of uh, communist uh, control. So I think uh, the, if you look at the uh, short term and mid term and longer term, there is a difficulty there. But I think uh, the, all this is not only competition part, but also collaborative part still there. And then a major trade is still there and it's not going away. And I, you know, as uh, <clears throat> Mike said, that it's difficult to, to shape the China. But I think uh, by sending uh, the, all the message around to China, including security message, and also our readiness to compete and collaborate. Collaboration part is still there. And we shouldn't look at the issue with China solely for the, for in, in the security grounds. I mean, and especially around um, Taiwan. Taiwan is not on the issues, uh, but I think if we look at the totality, I think there is still the probability that we could work out some arrangement with China. For that one, I think uh, Japan is also ready uh, to address uh, the, all this uh, you know, difficulty with China together with the United States and friend and allies in the region, because China should be a part of the process. We shouldn't really alienate China uh, for the formation of a regional, you know, geoeconomic uh, security part too, because I think at the end, I think uh, total dislinkage is impossible. So for the moment, I think we should go on on, on this, uh, you know, economic security. That is fine. We need to safeguard, but China would safeguard. So there should be some moment for both sides to look into what should be the best way. And I, for that one, I'm not totally pessimistic. Well, thank you very much. Um, you know, we have many interesting questions and really no time to get to them, but I want to acknowledge we have questions uh, that uh, raise uh, the points that you have just made, Ambassador Sasai, asking whether uh, uh, now that uh, China has extended an interest in CPTPP, whether uh, Japan uh, would be uh, open uh, to that, um, uh, or will Japan uh, think it's better to um, uh, to keep that going slowly? We have questions asking whether a in-person Xi Biden summit is conceivable uh, in uh, the Biden uh, during uh, this administration. Uh, we have other questions uh, challenging the proposition uh, that really there could be a decoupling given uh, the significance of the Chinese uh, economy um, and, uh, uh, and others asking whether, uh, you know, what would be the consequence of uh, Shinzo Abe's visit uh, to Taiwan? Uh, uh, should that uh, come to be. So many interesting and uh, intriguing questions that regrettably we don't have time to engage, but is a good indication of the expertise of our very large audience. So 
Um, I hope uh, that we will have a chance to bring you all together again. This has been a marvelous and important uh, uh, nuanced uh, conversation. And let me just thank you on behalf of all of us at CJEB, um, our speakers and our keynote uh, panel and all of our attendees. I think we've heard some really insightful comments that leave us with a great deal uh, to think about in the months ahead. And of course, uh, we once again thank CJEB's corporate and individual sponsors for their support, uh, especially in these difficult times. And, uh, you know, this is day one of several days uh, of a uh, program. So I invite all those who are watching to please register for the other days of our conference on our website. Thanks again to our attendees and to our outstanding speakers. Thank you for joining us.